Luke chapter 11 and beginning in verse number 1. The title of this message is Teach Us How to Pray. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, as it is in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive every one who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Look at verse number five. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise, that's a big word, and give him as many as he needs. And I say unto you, look at verse 9, ask. Everybody say ask. Ask. It's so simple. And it shall be given to you. Seek. Everybody say seek. Seek. And you shall find. Knock. Come on, say knock. knock. And it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receive. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it shall be opened. Teach us how to pray. If you could be alone with Jesus for a few moments or maybe for an hour, it was just you and him one-on-one for one hour. You have the ability in that hour to talk to him about anything you want to talk to him about. You can ask him anything you want to ask him and you can ask him to teach you anything you would have him to teach you. I wonder what it would be. I wonder how many believers, if they had one hour with Jesus, if they would say, Lord, talk to me about that time you walked on water and teach me how to do that. I really want to show out for Pastor Alex and Tony and these guys who think they're real cool. I want to walk on water, Jesus. Amen. Could you teach me how you did that? Could you teach us how to raise the dead? Maybe you would ask him, how do we open blind eyes? Maybe you would ask him, how do we heal deaf ears? You see, the disciples were with Jesus for three and one half years. And they saw miracles that Jesus did that absolutely blew their minds. They they saw the things that many of us dream of seeing. And thank God we're in a church that God's moving because we've been seeing miracles even in the day that we live in because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Can you say amen? But they watched him go to a leper and cleanse a leper. And they watched before their very eyes the, the skin of that leprous human begin to cure and and the and the leprosy begin to fall off right they saw that with their very own eyes they watched Jesus go up to a crowd of 5,000 people and look at a little boy and borrow his lunch and was able to feed 5,000 people with a little boy's lunch they saw that with his with their very own eyes they they saw with their very own eyes Jesus take water and turn it into wine. I wish somebody was in this place. I'm I'm talking about the miracle maker today. I'm I'm talking about the one who said nothing is impossible for those who believe. I'm, I'm telling you about a man today who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ever ask or imagine. They saw with their very own eyes 
him stand up and preach. And the result was the masses of people repented of their sins and they followed him and obeyed him. And they could have asked Jesus anything. They could have said, Jesus, we want you to teach us the ABCs of signs and wonders. We want you to show us how to do what you've been doing. But no, the only thing you'll find in the four Gospels that the disciples ever asked Jesus to teach them how to do was to pray. Isn't that amazing today? If you had one hour with the Lord, would prayer be at the top of your list? Maybe you would ask him why there's so much evil in the world. Maybe you would ask him why there's so much sickness. Maybe you would ask him all these other questions. But the solution to man's problem is prayer, ladies and gentlemen. The answer to yours and I's miracle is prayer, ladies and gentlemen. I'm telling you, when God's people pray, things begin to happen. So the only thing the disciples ever asked him, look at verse 1. They said, teach us how to pray. Now I want to look at this request they had a couple different ways this morning if you're taking notes. Number one, prayer contains the ingredients for the supernatural to operate in your life. Am I, do I need to get down here today? Everybody stand up. Come on, everybody on your feet. If I got to stand up all sermon, you're going to stand up too. <laughs> Glory to God. Now, once you think you're awake, come on, shake. Come on, wake up with me. Come on. Come on, you're in a Pentecostal church, not a funeral today. Come on, shake. Some of you aren't shaking right now, and if you're sitting there quiet in a minute, I'm going to come shake you. Glory to God. All right. Now, if you think you're awake, go ahead and sit back down. I'll let you sit. I'll let you sit. But I'm not going to do this alone today, okay? I, I'm not gonna, I need your help today. I, I need some spirit-filled people today to get with me this morning. I, I need some Pentecostal people a moment ago who was dancing and praising the Lord. Listen, the most important part of your day today is the next 30 minutes when God's Word is open and revelation comes to you. I need some people to get with me in the Word this morning. Now I'm watching you. Bobby Johnson would have made you stay all, stand up all service. He would have. I saw him do it once to a church service. They weren't with him. He said, y'all stand the entire time. And he preached an hour and ten minutes that Sunday morning. <laughs> my, my, my. Y'all think I'm rough today. Now let me say that statement again that so many of you were asleep and would have missed the rapture if the trumpets would have sounded when I said it. Let me say it again because I want you to get this deep down in your spirit today. Prayer contains the ingredients for the supernatural to operate in your life. Now look again at verse number 1. Don't miss this of our text. Chapter 11 verse 1 says, When he was finished... When he was finished, it came to pass that he was praying in a certain place. And when he ceased or when he finished, I want you to see this today. It's almost like the disciples were watching him pray. It's almost like they were standing back to the side and maybe in a bush or something and kind of peeking through the bush, watching him over there all alone on his knees praying because the Bible says when he was finished. You know, something interesting about prayer and about Jesus is that Jesus never once prayed with his disciples. Every time he prayed, he went off alone. He didn't get in a group and say, guys, let's join hands and sing Kumbaya. No, friend. He always went off alone. He left them. He went away from them. He went off to a solitary place. He went to a hiding place, if you will. And the Bible says that when he was finished, they came to him and said, can you teach us how to pray? It's almost like they're in this bush and they're watching him. And, and when it was time to pray, he would say, you stay here. Why? Because prayer, listen to me today, is a very personal thing. The victory that you will walk in in your life will be a result of what happened in your personal prayer closet on Monday morning and Tuesday morning and Wednesday morning and Thursday morning. Listen, you may get victories corporately. God moves in corporate, but I'm going to tell you, you only walk and keep that victory when you learn to do the secret thing called prayer that they were watching him do that early morning. Prayer is a personal thing. Oh, but we love group prayer, don't we? We love group prayer because we don't like to pray. 
Group prayer is easy because one person takes the microphone while everybody else just bows their head and listens to that prayer. And after the group prayer is over, we go up and say, that was such a beautiful prayer you prayed. We love group prayer because we can leave all the praying up to the pastor or we can leave all the praying up to the worship pastor or we can leave all the praying up to daddy or to our husband or whoever it may be that's praying for you. We love group prayer because we don't have to do anything. I'm, I'm trying to help somebody today. But prayer is a personal thing. It's a private discipline. There's nothing wrong with corporate prayer, but it shouldn't be your passion. There's nothing wrong with corporate prayer, but your passion should be in private prayer. Your passion should be what happens with you and the Lord one-on-one. -on -one. Because listen to me, in corporate prayer, group prayer, we can get lost in the crowd and not have to say a thing. In corporate prayer, you can just kind of get lost in the little group and not have to give an account to the Lord. Oh, it's quiet in here. And that's okay. It's quiet now because now I'm actually preaching, see? It, it's, it's corporate prayer, prayer is okay with everybody because, because anybody who doesn't really have an individual prayer life can just kind of fit right in with no problems whatsoever. You know, why was the only thing that they ever asked him to teach them? Why was it prayer? Out of three and a half years of anything they could ask the Lord, the only thing they asked him was teach us how to pray. What they were saying to him is teach us how to do this thing that you do by yourself every morning. Every morning we wake up and you're already gone. And we go looking for you and you're over kneeling at a tree stump. Teach us that thing. Teach us that thing that you do early in the morning before the sun ever rises and you take off. Teach us that thing we see you do from behind the bush. Look at Mark chapter 1 and verse number 35. The gospel of Mark chapter 1. Verse 35, it says, and in the morning, everybody say, and in the morning, <laughs> rising up a great while before day. Now in Israel, day is easily 6 a.m., if not earlier. 6 a.m. would be like sleeping in in Israel. Anybody been to Israel before? 6 a.m., they're already at work. They're, the, the city is moving at 6 a.m. They don't have a 9 to 5 schedule. 6 a.m., you're late for work if you're there at 6.01 so catch this here, Mark 1, and look at it, verse 35. And in the morning, rising up a great while before life starts. That could have been anywhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. It says, he went out, Jesus, and departed into a solitary place. And there he did what? Pray. He prayed. Now I want you to catch something here because it says in the morning, maybe the NIV says very early in the morning, while it was still dark, before the day had ever started, every time the disciples woke up, they caught him doing this thing called prayer. What an awesome thing. And then he would say, after his prayer time in the morning, and he would come back over to them, after being in prayer in the dark for a few hours that morning, he would come over to those 12 disciples and he would say, guys, let's go to town. That's really how the day went every day with Jesus. He woke up very early in the morning while it was still dark. He went into a solitary place and prayed, came back and met with his disciples and said, let's go to town. And they would go to town and you know what would happen all day long? Jesus would do really crazy things all day long. I'm talking, this is what we read about in our Bible. A lot of times we skip over the praying and all that stuff and look just at the miracles. That's the crazy stuff he was doing. Listen to me this morning. It was awesome. He would come out of that prayer closet after a few hours in dark, in solitary praying. He would look to his disciples, say, let's go to town. They would go to town. There'd be a blind man. He'd walk up to a blind man and he would say to the blind man, what would you have me do for you today? And the blind man would say, I just want to see. And Jesus would look at him and say, see. And 
instantly the man would begin to see. And then they'd walk by and they'd go by a demon possessed man. He was, he was, he was, he was vexed with demonic spirits. And he would say, what would you have me to do today for you today? And they'd say, this man has been bound. He cuts himself. He groans in, 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 in different uh, uh, demonic voices. And, and he needs liberty. He needs freedom. And Jesus would simply, in a fraction of a second, look at the man and say, go. And instantly, every demon inside of that man would leave that man's body and he'd be free, praise God. I, I'm telling you today, Jesus did crazy things when he went to town. He was walking by one day and a family came running up to him and said, our daughter is dead. Can you help her? They get to her. She's dead. There's no life in her, no breath in her lungs. And in a fraction of a second, Jesus says, rise up. And just like that, breath fills her lungs again. Color comes back into her complexion and she comes alive. Why? Because Jesus does crazy things when he goes to town. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, he is an awesome God. He is a mighty God. Now listen to me today. My goodness. It took him a fraction of a second to do that, but took him four hours this morning to do this other thing called prayer. The disciples, they start scratching their head. Remember, they're about to ask him one thing. Teach us how to pray. They start scratching their heads thinking, man, he just goes up and says, see, and they see. It takes a split second. He just goes up to these people and he says, live again, and they come alive. In a split second. He walks up to people and says, here. And deaf people hear in a fraction of a second. But it takes him hours to do that other thing called prayer. Is anybody with me today? You see, the disciples begin to connect the dots. Now we, when we miss prayer, we miss everything. Because in our Pentecostal prayerless church services, we spend hours trying to cast demons out of people. I mean, we get people and we, I tell you, I, I'm so glad. I, Lord, listen, Lord forbid demon-possessed person ever walk into a prayerless Pentecostal church. Because they're going to get jerked around, spit on, hit, knocked upside the head. They're going to get taken back to some deliverance closet where all the super spiritual prayerless anointed intercessors show up. They got the badge that says intercessors but ain't been in prayer all week long. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, I, I'm, I'm telling you today, the, you, got the, you got the people that come by that's read the deliverance manual and we know how to cast. We went to the Brownsville Revival Deliverance School. We've been trained to cast out demons but ain't been in the prayer closet all week long. My Lord, help us. Poor Lord, help that poor demon-possessed person because you know what we do? We get a hold of them. We hit them. I bind you, devil, in the name of Jesus. Somebody next to them says, and I loose you and I rebuke you and I'm telling you we scream and we shout and we spit and we do everything and that poor soul leaves possessed y'all know what I'm talking about today that's what happens in a Pentecostal prayerless church with prayerless people that ain't been in the prayer closet they connected the dots the disciples came to this conclusion when you pray things happen it's not deep, it's not real theological, but they connected the dots, they figured it out, and that's why they said, teach us this one thing. Teach us how to pray. Why? Because when you pray, things happen. Listen, give me a demon-possessed person and somebody that's been in their Holy Ghost prayer closet all week long. Them demons ain't got a chance staying in that vessel, that earthly body. Give me, give me an anointed prayer warrior that knows how to call upon the Lord, that knows how to seek God and has been seeking the Lord. There's nothing that can stand in the way of a person that prays to an almighty God. Yeah. Whoo, glory to God. They connected the dots. I'm telling you today, prayer contains the ingredients for the supernatural to start happening in your life. Prayer is the answer for supernatural ministry. You want to see miracles? Prayer. You want to see God things happen? Prayer. You want to see big things happen? Prayer. You want to see the Lord, the Lord move in your life this year? Prayer. You want to see Lord bless your ministry this year? Prayer. I'm telling you today, you want to go deeper in God? Prayer. Prayer, prayer, prayer is the answer. Well, you know what we do. We spend a minute with God in the morning. 
and then four hours in the afternoon trying to solve the problem. We spent a quick little few seconds with the Lord and then all day long wonder why things aren't coming into being for us and lining up the way they should. <laughs> we spent a few seconds seeking God, then we wonder why he hasn't provided that job. Why he hasn't healed? Why is isn't moving in our ministry? Why our marriage is in the shape it's in? My, 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 my. Why our finances are in the shape they're in? Why everything's going south? Because we spend a minute in prayer and spend hours trying to solve our problems. See, we've got it backwards. They watched him hours in the prayer closet and seconds solving problems. So they said, teach us how to pray. You know, ministry wasn't Jesus' daily focus. Prayer was. Did you hear me? Ministry was not Jesus' daily focus. Prayer was. Praying to God. Prayer should be your first choice, not your last resort. Did you hear me today? How often do we try everything else and we say, well, I guess we'll have to just pray about it. How many people have brought their sick kids to me? So, Pastor, we've taken them to Children's Hospital. They've run all sorts of tests, can't find anything. Pastor, we've taken them all the way to Houston, and we've taken them here, and we've taken them there, and we just can't get any answers, and, and Pastor this and Pastor that. And so we're just now bringing them to you so you can pray for them. You should have brought him here first. You should have brought that child here first. I said you should have brought the child to the Lord first. Because God answers prayer, church. Prayer shouldn't be your last resort. It should always be your first choice. Amen. Amen. You know, people say, but it takes so much time to pray. Prayer is time invested. Oh my, I'm going to help some of you tonight. This helped me when I received it. I know it will help you. Prayer is time invested. You all got checking accounts. You make deposits, right? Some of you wish you made a few more deposits into that checking account. I know. You make deposits so you can withdraw. I used to tell my mom when I was a kid, I'd ask her if we'd do something. She'd say, we don't have the money. I'd say, write a check. Okay. Y'all know where I'm at. Okay. I, I'm with you. You're with me. Amen. Just write a check. She'd say, that's not how it works. You got to have money in the bank. No, just write a check. You can pay for it later. <laughs> you can go to jail for that. <laughs> Nowadays, instead of write a check, kids say, just use the credit card. <laughs> but you put money into the bank so you can take money out when you need it. I want you to look at prayer that way. Prayer is time invested. You are making deposits into your spiritual bank account. You know what happens when you sit down or kneel down or lay down or when you rise up early in the morning to pray before your day begins? You are making a spiritual investment into your life for that day and for that week. You know why? Because prayer empowers you. Prayer anoints you. Prayer, it, it builds you up. Prayer prepares you and prayer will change you. It's a spiritual investment. It's making a deposit into your spiritual account because throughout the day, I promise you, you're going to need to make withdrawals. My wife can tell me when I'm not prayed up and when I am. She can tell me that at any intersection in Little Rock, whether or not I've spent time in prayer making deposits. <laughs> You know why? Because prayer brings the flesh under control. Prayer kills the flesh. And then all of a sudden you're sitting at a light and somebody does something crazy. Huh. And I've been in four wrecks since I've moved to this city. <laughs> Enough for my insurance company to drop me. It's bad. And it's not my fault. It's all them people's fault. <laughs> Only one of them was my fault. Y'all going to drop me over that? <laughs> One was my fault. Three was their fault. Well, it still points against you. You need to stay away from them. Three out of four happened right here in front of the church. I have to go through there to get where I work. <laughs> Buy me a helicopter and fly here. <laughs> 
Got one believing with me for that. Amen, Tim. I like that great faith, brother. Great faith. Amen. <laughs> Get Jesse to plant us and Kenneth Copeland fly me. Amen. I'll leave that there. You know, you've been making spiritual deposits into your account. Then all of a sudden, you're able to withdraw when you need it. You're able to withdraw some self-control when you need it. Are you with me today? I'm talking about making spiritual deposits. Prayer allows you to make withdrawals. Prayer allows you to withdraw peace when you're under terror or under some panic attack. Depositing prayer into your spiritual account allows you to withdraw the power of God when you lay your hands on somebody. Prayer is a deposit into your spiritual account that all through the day, when you need joy, you can withdraw. When you need peace, you can withdraw. When you need anointing, you can withdraw. When you're being tempted by the enemy. Listen, people say, oh, I struggle with this. I just, I just, pastor, I just keep struggling. I keep struggling. I keep struggling. I say, when you start praying more than you're struggling, you'll be delivered from that thing. Why? Because the only way you can overcome some things is when you start depositing prayer into your spiritual account. So you come out of that prayer closet and you're not laying empty hands on empty heads. All of a sudden, you come out of the prayer closet and your hands are charged with the power of God and the anointing of God. And you lay your hands on people and things happen because prayer works. Crazy things begin to happen when you walk out of that prayer closet. You know, prayer and fasting are, are so important. Jesus said there's some things you, you can't do until you've prayed and fasted. We won't read it, but you can write it down or turn to it and read it later. Mark chapter 9 Verse 23 through 29. You know the story. Jesus said there's some that only come out through prayer and fasting. Jesus cast demons out. Demons didn't go out for the disciples. Why not, Lord? We said in the name of Jesus. What happened, Lord? And he said this kind only go out through prayer and fasting. Meaning there's things you're going to face through your day that's going to require the disciplines of prayer and fasting Fasting, if you're going to walk in victory that day. There's things you're going to come up against in the spiritual realm that will require prayer and fasting. Listen, I don't know how ministries work without prayer and fasting. You didn't hear me. I, I don't know how ministries even work without prayer and fasting. If you think that we have got to where we're at in the freedom and the spirit realm because of good preaching and because of Pentecostal worship leading, you're fooled, friend. Because talent is out there everywhere you go. I'm telling you, there's chains that have been broken and freedom in this place because somebody has been seeking God and has been praying. Hallelujah. Now, I know a lot of us benefit from it. Because every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. back here in the youth room, there's a handful of people with Pastor Dennis praying for one thing that day, the service. The service. And because of you and that handful of people, the rest of us get to come in and benefit in a, from a free Holy Ghost charged service because somebody had been praying that morning. <laughs> Glory to God. Thank God for prayer warriors. What we need is about 25 more to join you back there on Sunday morning and quit receiving this free of charge, but go into the prayer closet themselves because if we can get more and more people praying, things are going to happen in this place. God told me one year ago this month, he said, Dwayne, you will have, there is a time coming and it's coming soon where you will have to make yourself walk into the pulpit and preach because the anointing will be so thick and the glory will be so strong that you'll think every Sunday, week after week, well, better not preach today. Just, we better just rejoice and, 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 and have fun in this glory. He said, you're going to have to, why? Because there's people that, that, listen, prayer begins to change the atmosphere of where you're at. Prayer, have you ever had a bad day and then started praying? The atmosphere changed, didn't it? Have you ever been angry and decided, well, I'm just going to break through this through prayer? Your atmosphere begins, to, my Lord, thank you, Jesus. Have you ever felt bad and you decided to pray? The atmosphere around you begins to change. Why? Prayer changes atmosphere atmospheres. Ma, 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 ma. I don't know how ministries work without prayer and fasting. 
I remember when Crystal and I started our youth ministry in Springfield, Missouri. We had seven kids our first Wednesday night. My pastor told me when he hired us, he said, you need to fill the gym with teenagers or you're fired. You have a year. That's what he told me. He gave me seven to start with. John wasn't even in there in that seven. He said, I need you to fill the gym. You have a year to do it with teenagers or you're fired. I didn't even want the job anyhow. I didn't. I didn't want to be no youth pastor, put up with teenagers all day. I remember walking out thinking, that guy's crazy. I'm out of here. And I remember putting my hand on the, on the handle of my door to get inside my car. And the Lord spoke to me and said, this is where I've called you. Okay. <laughs> Started with seven. The next Wednesday night we had four. That's true. Went from seven to four. I thought at this rate I'm fired next Wednesday. <laughs> maybe in two weeks. Maybe I've got two more weeks. I might get a month's salary here at this rate. I told Crystal, I said, we got to pray. We got to pray, Crystal. John was one that was reached in our youth ministry there. And in a year's time, we had 100 people showing up in our youth ministry, teenagers being saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, being touched by the power of God. And one of them now is our youth pastor here. And yeah, we gave out free pizza, and yeah, we did crazy stuff to get those people there. But I'm going to tell you, the reason John came to our church is because my wife walked onto his school campus and invited him to come to our church. She won him by going onto that school campus, but I promise you, she never went on a school campus in Springfield, Missouri, until her and I had been in the prayer closet praying, God, give us young people. God, save Springfield. God, raise up an army. God, do a mighty work in this city we prayed and it happened you want to see revival in your ministry in your department start praying start asking start believing God to do something man I'm getting us back to prayer today church Whew. I'm going to tell you if you want to see the dead raised you're going to have to pray if you want to see that youth room filled with teenagers you're going to have to pray if you want to see miracles, you're going to have to learn to pray and to fast. Somebody say amen. amen. Say this with me. Little prayer, little prayer. equals little power. Little much prayer, prayer equals much power. That's right. You wondering why anything, nothing's happening in your life? Pray. Wondering where the power of God is, where the miracles are? Pray. Little prayer, little power. Much prayer, much power. God spoke to me one year ago, and I shared this with you. I shared it with the church, I believe, in our State of the Church address a year ago. God spoke to me. We had a great year in 2014. Crystal and I were elected in February of 2014, came to be pastors in March of 2014. And in January, not even a year later, January of last year, 2015, we were celebrating all that God had done in less than a year's time. And God spoke to me and he said this, and, and some of you have already heard, heard me say this. But he said, everything that you received in 2014 was my gift to you. It was free, it didn't cost you anything. That's how he said it to me. It's free. He said, but everything you're going to receive in 2015 corporately, you're going to only receive it when you pray. In other words, he told me I was going to have to go after the things of God and not just sit back and receive them. He said, you're going to have to pray. So now as I look back on 2015 and think it was 10 times better than 2014 was, it's a result of people praying. I don't know about you, but I'm believing God that 2016 is going to be a year that a year from now, we look back and go, wow, God. Wow, God. Because he answers prayer. He answers prayer. That's what the Lord told me. He said, it'll come with a price. And I said, what's the price? He said, prayer. Prayer is a price. It's an investment. And this year is no different in your life. If you're going to walk in the anointing and walk in spiritual authority and walk in the supernatural, you'll have to pray. You'll have to make prayer a priority. The second thing I learned from this text or this question, Lord, teach us how to pray, 
Lord, teach us how to pray. Listen to me, means there's a right way to pray and a wrong way to pray. Now, I want everybody to listen, please. If you don't hear anything else, hear me these next few moments. Someone asked me once, they said, why don't people pray? You have a barbecue at church, you'll have to borrow more chairs to seat all the visitors that come with the normal people. You have a prayer meeting, you can find the smallest little room in the church and call it the prayer closet. Why don't people pray? And here's the answer. Because they don't get results. I think beyond the time investment it is, beyond the discipline, because prayer is a discipline. Jesus woke up early in the morning and went while it was still dark. It's a discipline, yes. It's an investment of your time, yes. And you all live very busy lives, yes. It will, it will require you to cut something out or to wake up earlier or to do something different if you're going to take prayer to the next level this year. I understand all that. But above all these things, the reason people don't pray is because they don't get results. Here's how I know that. Don't you think if you really believe God would answer, and God really did answer, that you'd pray about it? If prayer really is the tool for God to answer and to move, wouldn't it be important in your life? Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, it is. Prayer is the tool. It is the answer. If prayer works so well, then why do we have to beg people, Pastor Dennis, to come to prayer meeting? Oh, it's getting real quiet in here now. Nancy couldn't get out of her driveway. It froze back over last night. She sent me a picture. She's our women warriors. And I know some of you women work, but I wonder if prayer works so well, why wouldn't every woman who's able, who's off, get here on Tuesdays and be a part of that Tuesday morning prayer meeting? If we really believed in it, it's okay if you're quiet right now. Because if you're praying and nothing is happening, you're praying wrong. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Teach us how to pray. I said there's a right way to pray and there's a wrong way to pray. I used to tell people all the time, I used to say, my mom, everything she prays about, God answers. Isn't that right? We used to say, ask my mom. My mom ain't no special prayer warrior. She's no, you know, she's listening. I better, better be nice. She is a saint of God and she is a, you know, but she ain't one of these part of the intercessory team at her church and all that. But everything she asks God for, God does. Because she prays right. I want to teach you this morning how to pray right. Because some of you have been praying all wrong. How many of you want to pray in such a way that you do start seeing answers when you pray? How many of you want to pray in such a way that, that, that Jesus shows up when you pray? Amen. Yeah. So the disciples said, teach us how to pray. So let me give you a few things. Write them down. Number one, right ways of praying. Number one, ask and you shall receive. Listen to me today. I don't hope God answers prayer. I know God answers prayer. I don't ask him wondering. I wonder if he will or not. When I ask him and it comes out of my mouth, I know God's going to do it. I know. Why? Because he said in his word, if you ask me, you shall receive. If you ask, I shall answer. Listen to me. He says ask. That means open up your mouth and speak the request. None of this praying in your mind or visualing your prayer. That's mind control. Don't meditate. Don't stare into a crystal ball. He said, ask and you shall receive. None of this sitting back, mm, having yoga for 30 minutes and getting your mind right. No, open your mouth and ask the Lord. Lord, I'm asking you to heal my child who has fever. I believe you, God, to take that fever away. In the name of Jesus, open your mouth and ask. Woo, it's the right way to pray. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 22 the word of the Lord says this, and all things, whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. Everybody shout out, you shall receive. You shall receive. If you have something against prayer, don't be mad at me today. It's what he said. Whatsoever things you ask, believing, you shall receive. Amen. Amen. You got to ask the right way. You got to ask believing. Well, Lord, I know I'm not really that worthy and you probably got bigger and better things to worry about than me, but if you could, you know, make a little time today to meet this need. Friend, you might as well just keep blah, 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 blah. 
That ain't a prayer of faith. Ask believing is what it says here in Matthew 21. Listen to me. Daniel prayed and it shut the mouths of lions. Amen. Moses prayed and the sea split. Elijah prayed and God sent cloven tongues of fire to consume the sacrifice and the 12 barrels of water. Ask him to receive. Why? Because he's a giant slayer. He can slay every giant in front of you. Ask him to divide the sea that's in front of you and turn your enemies into fish food. Ask him to walk with you in the fiery furnace and he will. Glory be to God. Amen. Ask him. Ask him to show you great and mighty things. Ask him. Why? Because he's the God that cannot fail. Ask, ask, ask him. Are you in a battle? Pray. Are you facing the devil this week? Pray. Are you facing many problems? Ask him. Pray about it. Do you need a miracle? Pray. Is your marriage under attack? Pray. If you're lost and without God, pray because God answers prayer. Ooh, after preaching this, there ought to be everybody wanting to rise up and pray this week. You know what? God wants you to ask big. Big. Everybody say big. Big, big stuff. We're asking God for big things. Ask him to move mountains. I've watched him do it. Has he moved a mountain for anybody in this place? I remember one need Crystal and I had. We had to sell this one house. It was a, it was a flipper house we were doing. And, and, the, and we run into a lot of problems with it in the, in the market and, and legal things that we had no control over. And that thing, our realtor told me, she said, you might as well turn it into a rental house. Because we had to get all of the neighbors on that private road to sign a private road agreement for it, to, for it to go through any kind of loan program. And she said, good luck trying to get the neighbors to sign a road maintenance agreement. Huh. Went and knocked on their doors. There was three neighbors to that house we had to sell. All three of them said, yeah, right. We're just country folk. We keep the road looking good. We ain't signing our name to anything. Basically, an agreement that says if there's problems with the road, we'll split the cost. Divide it by four. And anybody that wanted to buy our house that was getting any kind of loan, the bank required that road maintenance agreement to be attached to those papers. We had three buyers. We had three people sign a contract for that house. And all three times the bank caught it said we need a road maintenance agreement. It's a private road. The only reason it didn't run into us when we bought the house because we paid cash for that house. The Lord had blessed us. I said the Lord had blessed us. We bought a $60,000 house and paid cash for the thing because the Lord had blessed us with other houses. And, and so we either needed God to send somebody else that was going to pay this time $125,000 cash Amen. or we turned it into a rental. Said, you ain't getting anybody with a loan. She said, it's impossible. Knocked on all their doors. They said, no, it isn't going to happen. I remember being at youth camp that summer and she called me. She said, we have another buyer. The this was the third buyer. The bank's wanting that road maintenance agreement. She said, I think I'm going to go to them. Maybe since, because we bought this house in a place we did not live. She said, maybe since I'm local and in the area, they'll trust me rather than an investor that's just walking in here, has no interest in them or that house whatsoever. She said, I, th I think I'll go and ask them. She said, you're a preacher, right? That's what she told me. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, it's time to start praying. She wasn't even saved. I said, all right, I'm going to start. I remember walking. I, I stood outside in front, of the, in front of that Assemblies of God youth camp. And I began to pray like I'd been praying for a year. We'd been praying for God to move that house. Praying like I'd prayed every other time. But this time something came upon me that was different. All of a sudden I started viewing that house is a mountain standing in my way. And I started speaking to that mountain. He said, ask, open your mouth. I started speaking to that mountain and commanding it. And listen, Jesus didn't say pray and ask me to remove the mountain. He said, you speak to the mountain and tell it to be removed. My Lord, hallelujah. Listen, a lot of things we're going to him asking him to do when he's told us to do in prayer. So he said, quit asking me for it and start speaking to it. So I started speaking to that impossible situation and telling it to be cast into the sea and get out of my way in Jesus' name. I felt faith. Lean, I felt the anointing. I felt 
felt the power of God so strong standing out there. My Lord, the power of God was on me. And I said, amen. And then I held my phone and I waited for the call. Three hours later, it rang. She called me. She said, Dwayne, listen, listen, listen. I've got great news for you. I was able to get all three of your neighbors to sign the road maintenance agreement. And our law firm is going to pay for the paperwork to have it drawn up. You are a blessed man. I begin to just shout and praise God. Something happens when you open your mouth and ask them. Woo. God answers prayer. You got to ask big. Turn to your neighbor and say, we got to ask big. You got a big incurable disease. God is an expert in those. You got something impossible. You got something the doctors have said there's no hope for. God, he just loves those things. He is an expert in incurable diseases. He's an expert in hopelessness. He's a big God. He can do anything. Do you know who you're talking to when you pray? Do you realize who you're talking to when you pray? Do you understand how big he is? You know, they just found like a ninth planet, several times bigger than the earth. Everybody's amazed at that. Wow, they found a big planet. They ain't never seen before. I ain't amazed by that. I'm amazed by the big God that holds it all in his hands. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> Do you realize when, you're asking, when you talk to God, you're talking to the one who spoke the world into existence, who in six days created the very universe you and I live inside of? You're talking to the creator of heaven and earth when you pray. You're talking to the one who owns the cattle of a thousand hills. You're talking to the one who has gold as asphalt in heaven. You're talking to the one who will give you wells you did not dig, vineyards you did not plant, houses you did not build. He will make you the head and not the tail because nothing, nothing, nothing is impossible for for him. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Ask and you shall receive. Number two, you got to pray in the name of Jesus. John chapter 14 and verse number 14 says, If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. You don't need to pray to God in, 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 in Mary's name. Mary is not your intercessor. Jesus Christ is your intercessor. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4 verse 12, There's no other name given unto man by which we can be saved. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, Therefore, God exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Peter and John walking up to the temple at the gate called Beautiful saw a lame man. They reached out their hands and they said, Silver or gold have I not, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. In Acts chapter 16, a demon possessed woman who was a wolf in sheep's clothing followed 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 behind the disciples and she said these are men from God these are preaching the truth these are from the most high God telling you the way to be saved and Paul became annoyed with this woman because he knew she was demon possessed and he turned around to her and he said woman I command you in the name of Jesus leave and right there instantly the power of God deliver. I'm telling you, there's power in the name of Jesus. John, you were in Cairo with us when we went to win that city. Hundreds of young people in Cairo, Illinois filled that big gymnasium, that Catholic gymnasium. Cairo, Illinois, if you don't know where it's at, it's a city in Illinois where three rivers come together. Used to be a booming place. Everything left. And, and it's just a place, it's a city of projects is all it is. I remember we went and did a rally there to win those people. No move of God, no church. It was, it was, it was sad. It was really sad. One of the saddest places in the nation, I believe. And we filled that gym up with teenagers. 
And all through our worship, when our worship team, Ginevra was leading worship at that time, when our worship team was leading worship you could, and, the, and the speakers were blaring the music, you couldn't even hear the sound because the hundreds of people, that, the teenagers that filled that place, they were laughing, they were loud, they were playing. All you could hear was the sound of the crowd. No respect for the worship. They just, they didn't even know what was going on. You couldn't even hear when she would, when she would, when she would say, you know, we're going to the next song. You couldn't hear anything. And I remember walking and the, down the back side of that in a room full of unbelievers that had never been in church, didn't even know how to behave. I remember, I remember one guy, he, he stopped me. He, say, he said, hey, brother. I said, yeah. He said, did you get your shirt from J.C. Penney? I looked down. I said, what's it to you? He said, he said man, that's, you dress like a white boy. That's what he told me. I said, actually, I think I did get this at J.C. Penney on the clearance rack. That was happening during worship. It was loud. And I remember going to a closet, going to a little classroom, Pastor Mike, right before I got up to preach. And I I said, Lord, this is ridiculous. We can't even hear the music, much less when this little white boy gets up here that buys his clothes from J.C. Penney. I ain't got anything to say to them. They're not going to listen to me. Lord, I was scared. I'll be honest with you. I was afraid. I didn't know what was going to happen that night. I didn't even, I didn't even know. I just thought maybe we was going to have to shut it down. And I remember the Lord say to me, he said, when you open your mouth and speak my word, I will shut their mouths and I'll open their ears. And I walked out of that prayer closet and I waited to the side of the stage and when worship ended I walked up you couldn't even all you could hear was noise out there the worship team's leaving I opened my Bible I said I have a word from the Lord they couldn't even hear it I could barely hear it come out of my mouth and so I said okay I guess I'll just start praying and I begin to pray Father I pray you anoint this message I pray God you move in this place and you save souls tonight God have your way in this place as I'm praying the only person that could hear me was myself and I was praying in a microphone but at the end of that prayer when I said and nobody could hear it but there's power in it when I said and I pray this all in the name of Jesus immediately a holy hush came across that place you couldn't hear anything I'm my shut up I'm to crystal you remember it. I'm telling you if you dropped a pin you could hear it as I declared the gospel for the next 45 minutes nobody moved nobody made a sound and I gave the altar call and hundreds came to Jesus Jesus Christ that night. Why? There's power in the name of Jesus. His name is Jesus. I'm almost done. I'm teaching you the right way to pray. Number three, you got to pray. You got to ask according to the will of God. First John chapter 5 and verse number 14 says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. He says this is the confidence we have. Confidence means faith. It means faith. That means when we ask him, we're asking him in faith. We're believing. He says when you ask in confidence according to his will. Everybody look up here at me because I want you to know what that means. It means he has to agree to it. He'll do anything you ask according to his will means he has to be in agreement. According to his will, it has to be his will. You say, how can I know the will of God? Read the Bible. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. Is healing the will of God? You better believe it. Sometimes, most of the time, no, all the time. There's healing in the, in the, in the blood of Jesus Christ. You got to believe it. Number four, the fourth thing, praying right. you got to pray in faith, believing. Matthew 21, 22, we read it a moment ago. Ask in faith, he said. Going to God without faith is like going to Walmart without money. It's a waste of time. Now, I know it's not for some of you ladies here. You can go to Walmart, walk around all day long, not plan to buy a thing. Now, when I was growing up, we did that because that's all we had in Mountain Home. We had Walmart. We played hide-and-go-seek and everything else in Walmart. Now that I'm a grown man, I don't like going to Walmart. First few years of marriage, I thought I had to go to Walmart with my wife, make sure she didn't spend so much. You know, I had to like do inventory. I had to check everything. Like, no, we already have some of that, honey. You're... No. I had to be, you know, money manager. I don't care now. I don't, I, don't, I don't give a rip. I'm like, go. Buy the whole store as long as I don't have to go. Go and buy everything they've got at Walmart. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> plug your, I should have asked her to plug her ears. Listen to me, it doesn't take great faith to believe in a great God. It takes great faith to believe in something that only works once in a while. If I had a chair and sometimes it held me up and sometimes it didn't, it'd take a lot of faith for me to sit down in that thing. 
If sometimes that thing just fell and I fell to the ground, I'd really have to have great faith to be able to sit down in that thing. <laughs> I don't ever think twice when I come over and sit down in this chair. It's never let me down. I've never fallen, <laughs> my Lord. It's always done what it's supposed to do. It's always upheld me. It's always been there for me. I didn't have to think about it. I have to have great faith in this. Why? Because the chair is going to do what it's supposed to do. Listen, you don't have to have great faith in a great God. You just got to have. You just got to have a measure of faith in a great God of power. You just got to have a measure of faith to believe that God can do this and God can perform this. Praise God. Right way to pray. You've been asking but not believing. You've been asking, but doubting. You're not going to get it. And I close with this, the right way to pray. You need to pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, also helps us in our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which words cannot be uttered. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Jude verse 20 talks about praying in the Holy Ghost, praying in tongues, praying in the Spirit being filled with the Spirit. And when you go to God in prayer, you pray in that heavenly language that the Bible talks about. And he says you pray for things you don't even know you're praying for. And when you don't know what to pray for, pray in the Spirit. You know what I love about praying in tongues? You never pray wrong, Brother Jimmy. Because it's the Holy Ghost praying through you. And the Holy Ghost isn't going to ask anything that is out of the will of God. You understand? It's always a perfect prayer. I'll never forget one night, and I'm going to wrap this up. Matter of fact, brother, if you want to come on to the mic or to the piano, please. I'll never forget one night we got babysitters for the kids, and Crystal and I was going to go to watch a movie, go on a date. We went and had dinner somewhere, and we went to this movie to watch, and we sitting in there and, you know, you parents that have kids, you know what I'm talking about. That's a, that, those are special times when somebody takes your kids for you and you get to go on a date without them. Lena, those are very special times, aren't they? I mean, <laughs> they are. They really are. Because normally you got the kids tagging along, you know, and that's not always a bad thing. But when, when you want a little, listen, you got to keep, you got to, romance, you got to keep that, you got to keep that fire burning. Amen. Some of you men ain't got your wives anymore because you didn't keep the fire burning and somebody else brought a fire to her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I felt the anointing on that one. You got to keep them surprised. I used to be real good at that. Now I taught you. Now she surprises me a lot of times. You know what she did for... You know what she did, did for us for our anniversary in August? She took me to the hotel where we had youth convention at and where we first met and started dating right here in Little Rock. Surprised me. And this time we got to sleep in the same room. I said, when we were here that first time, I was using women, girls' room. I was in the boys' room. Teenagers, we fell in love, held hands for the first time. She surprised me, took me there. We had dinner in the hotel, everything. The owner, it was the, what is it now? It was the Excelsior Marriott. The owner paid for everything, took care of our room. We, our, our, ticket, our food ticket came to $200 because it was paid for. <laughs> That's right. That chef come out and he said, it's on the house tonight. I hear y'all have a wonderful story. Told our story. He said, it's on the house. Get what you want. So I got what I want, $200 worth of it. <laughs> Don't ever take me to eat and tell me get what I want. <laughs> Hello. We was on a date, and I'm thinking, keeping it alive. Had a great dinner. Now we're at the movie that she got to pick out. Listen, guys, you let her pick it out. And then you go with your buds and go watch the action movies, okay? 
Sit through them chick flicks. Amen. All right, we'll do it. God can do it. God can do it. I was sitting there in that movie. Previews going. Movie come on. All of a sudden the anointing come on me. This wasn't a Christian movie. It wasn't War Room. Some chick flick. The anointing come on me. And all of a sudden I start speaking in tongues. And I was doing it quiet. Quietly speaking in tongues. It's coming out of my mouth, but you could hear it. But I was trying to, I couldn't stop it, Shannon. I could not stop it. Crystal looked at me and she said, what, what are you praying for? I said, I don't know. She said, is there something on your heart, on your mind? I said, I don't have a clue, but I can't stop it. And for an hour and a half through that movie, it was nonstop speaking in tongues. We left and the anointing was still on me that night. And in bed, I remember the Lord speaking to me and he said, you were praying for a need in your family. And that's all he said. The next morning, her dad called me. Becky, her dad called me the next morning. And he said, I want to tell you, and you can tell Crystal. But yesterday, I had some results from some tests that I had done. And they found some spots on my liver, on my kidneys was there another spot huh and lungs found spots on those three major organs we're going to go back for further tests but it's it's not looking good immediately i knew that i had been praying in tongues for her dad <laughs> i shared it with crystal and together we prayed in tongues and i knew remember you got to believe and I told him that. I said, actually, I prayed in tongues all night last night for you in the movie. Dirty dancing or whatever it was. <laughs> that was way before our time, so it wasn't dirty dancing. But just wanted to sound real spiritual. In a, in a secular movie, I was praying in tongues for you. Ruined my date and everything. Holy Ghost ruined it all. I said, you ain't got anything to worry about. And I forget how long it was, weeks, months. I don't even remember now. That was several years ago. We was in Sykes since five or six years ago. When he called us and said, they went back and looked at everything, did more tests, and there's not a single spot anywhere on them. Not a single spot. Not a single spot. Stand to your feet all over this place this morning.